Shalom. Welcome to Talmud for Beginners. Uh, we'll begin, uh, just go right into things, and we'll begin by covering what the Talmud actually is. The Talmud is composed of two major parts. Uh, the first part is called the Mishnah. Mishnah comes from a word meaning a repetition, or to repeat something. And from a root meaning to repeat something, it means a repetition. And the Mishnah is the core of the Talmud. It was compiled between uh, 200 and 220 CE by Yehuda Hanasi. Uh, Yehuda Hanasi was the uh, um, uh, uh, leader of the Jewish Sanhedrin at the time. And it was the Pharisaic Sanhedrin, and it was, uh, at that time, it was actually against the halacha to write down the oral Torah. But there was concern and fear that if these things were not written down because of the oppression that they were receiving from the Romans, that they might be lost entirely, rather than passed orally from generation to generation. And so uh, the uh, uh, Yehuda Hanasi compiled the Mishnah, and he compiled it under six. He collected all the the rulings of the uh, Sanhedrin that had been the Pharisaic Sanhedrin that had been in Jerusalem, and the Pharis and the Pharisaic Sanhedrin that had been at Yavne, and he collected all of the uh, cases that had been presented basically the case law uh, and all of the discussions of the case law and some other material as well, some of the sayings of the sages, for example. And he compiled all of these under six basic categories called siddurs and each, or orders, and of the six orders, these were all further subdivided into a total of 66 categories called tractates. And uh, um, so the 60, actually it was less than 66 originally, but some of them were later divided into uh, a tractate called Nezakim, for example, was divided into three smaller tractates. And so today we have 66 tractates. And uh, each covering a different specific halachic topic. Uh, the, uh, I remember now I said the Talmud, the core of the Talmud is the Mishnah, but the, uh, the rest of the Talmud is called the Gemara. The Gemara complements the Mishnah. Gemara is an Aramaic word meaning to complete or the completion or augmentation of something. And the Gemara completes the Mishnah. The Gemara is the commentary to the Mishnah. Uh, it is the uh, commentary by later sages who were discussing the case law in the Mishnah, and they were discussing uh, exact meanings of phrases and words and introducing nuances to cases. Uh, you know, well, what if there was a case like this or, or that? And, and so the discussions of the great academies. And uh, all of these are uh, compiled in the Gemara. Now, um, the, the Gemara contains not only the commentary to the Mishnah, but it often cites something called a Bereta, which is uh, a Bereta is a tradition, an oral tradition originally, from the same period as the Mishnah, but it's material that didn't get compiled into the Mishnah. Some of it comes from the Halakhic Midrashim, and some of it uh, uh, is in written form only in the Gemara. Um, and so we, this is what the Gemara is. Now I said the Gemara, but in actuality, there is more than one Gemara because there is more than one Talmud. When we talk about the Talmud in general, we're generally talking about the Babylonian Talmud. Um, but there's a Jerusalem Talmud and a Babylonian Talmud. The first Talmud was actually the Jerusalem Talmud and it was compiled, um, the namesake is a little bit misleading, it wasn't actually compiled at Jerusalem, it was compiled in Galil, or Galilee. 
and it was uh, um, compiled around 400 CE uh, from the uh, commentary and, and uh, as I discussed, the discussions of the case law by the sages that lived in Galil or Galilee. In, they were in Haaretz, which is why it's called the Jerusalem. Haaretz means the land, uh, which is why it's called the Jerusalem Talmud. But they weren't actually in Jerusalem because uh, uh, Jews weren't even allowed to go to Jerusalem during this time. Okay, um, the Babylonian Talmud was compiled a hundred years later, around 500 CE, and that it's a different Gemara. And the Babylonian Talmud uh, was compiled in the land of Babylon. Babylon is a term that's used to describe the uh, uh, the region of the Babylonian captivity. You see, as a result of the Babylonian captivity. Uh, and the return to the land that took place under Ezra and Nehemiah uh, at the end of the 70 years. There were three major centers of Jewish population. There was a Jewish population centered in Alexandria in Egypt. These were Jews that fled from the Babylonian captivity and settled in Egypt, which had, was an enemy of Babylon. It had been uh, allied uh, Previously, and so uh, they came to uh, uh, to settle there, and primarily in Alexandria, and that's where we have the Alexandrian Jewish community of Third Maccabees and uh, the Letter of Aristeas and and the writings of Philo. That Jewish community, however, f uh, uh, was wiped out after the Jewish revolt in one uh, in Alexandria in one sixteen CE. And so uh, it didn't survive to the time of the compiling of the Mishnah and the Gemara. The other Jewish community was in the region of Babylon because in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, if you read carefully, it was actually only a minority that returned with them to the land. The majority of Jewish people remained in uh, the land of Babylon. And so the... Uh, um, it's like the day, like today. Only a minority of Jewish people have returned and live in in Israel, and in the in the state of Israel. More Jews actually live in New York, <laughs> uh, from what I understand, than live in 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 uh, Jerusalem. Uh, so you have major Jewish centers in New York as well as in uh, Israel. Well, you had a major Jewish centers in the land of Babylon as well as in Haaretz in the land. And uh, this continued to be the case right up until the 19th century. In fact, for a very long time, at the time in the first century, at the time that the Talmuds and the Mishnah were compiled, the largest Jewish population in the world was actually in Babylon. And uh, as I said, that continued a thriving community there until the 19th century. And it's in the modern history of the Middle East that unfortunately that community was driven out and, and effectively no longer exists. <coughs> okay, so uh, um, uh, when we talk about the Babylonian Talmud, it's a geographic designation. It has, uh, you know, some people that like to defame the Talmud will, you know, snidely say, what's the Babylonian Talmud? As if to uh, indicate that it's somehow tainted Babylonian, uh, it's even you know named Babylonian because it's the Babylonian mystery religion mixed in or something. Uh, nothing could be further from the fact. In fact, there's an entire tractate of the Babylonian Talmud called Avodah Zarah, which uh, repudiates idolatry and pagan practices and uh, and the Babylonian mystery religion and, and uh, Babylonian holidays and so on, like Saturnalia, which you know things that reach back to Babylon. So uh, uh, it's not Babylonian except as a geographic designation. It would be like calling, you know, the Book of Daniel, we could say it's the Babylonian Book of Daniel because it was written in Babylon. Or, one of Kepha's letters, he says he was writing from Babylon. Some of the commentators interpret that to mean Rome uh, as a sort of euphemism. But it's just as likely, if not more likely, that Kepha is saying that he's writing from Babylon because the largest Jewish population of the world was in Babylon, so it only makes sense that he would have visited there. Um, 
So the Babylonian Talmud was compiled, as I said, around 500 CE. And the Babylonian Talmud is considered more authoritative than the Jerusalem Talmud for three important reasons. Uh, one, the Jerusalem Talmud was sort of a rush job. Uh, the Jewish people that compiled the Jerusalem Talmud were doing so, um, again, similar to the circumstances of the Mishnah. Uh, they believed they were under great oppression in Rome uh, under the Roman Empire, uh, because the land was under the rulership of the, of the Roman Empire at the time. And they were concerned that if they did not write these things down, and that they'd better write them down in a hurry, um, they would not survive. Uh, the, 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 the information would survive. And um, as a result, it was a rush job. Whereas the Babylonian Talmud, compiled a hundred years later, was compiled in the land of Babylon, which was in the neighboring Parthian Empire, um, which by contrast didn't have these kinds of oppressions that were taking place in the Roman Empire, so they could take their time and do a much more meticulous job. Another reason the Babylonian Talmud is considered more authoritative than the Jerusalem Talmud is because being written a hundred years later, it contains a hundred years more scholarship. It has a hundred years a uh, hundred years of more minds to draw from uh, in its, its Gemara. And finally, it's considered uh, more authoritative because the compilers of the Babylonian Talmud had the Jerusalem Talmud at their disposal. And so having the earlier work at their disposal, in fact, the Babylonian Talmud incorporates large portions of the Jerusalem Talmud right into the text, uh, often verbatim, uh, and so uh, uh, the Babylonian Talmud is considered a superior, more authoritative work than the Jerusalem Talmud. Okay, and so uh, uh, that's what the Talmud is. Studying the Talmud is a daunting job, especially if uh, you don't have any guidance or instruction because it is written uh, very... Um, it was originally intended to be memorized, uh, the Mishnah and later the Gemara, and so the phrases are short little catchphrases, the sentence structure is built upon uh, certain uh, repeating sentence structures with key phrases so as to be easy to memorize, and it's expected that you understand these phrases, and also because it is a, uh, a, a record, uh, a legal record of the court uh, presentations and rulings and the discussions uh, in the academies afterwards, it contains both the minority and the majority opinions. So the Talmud says many things uh, in recording minority opinions that later the Talmud objects to. And sometimes the Talmud presents different opinions and the Gemara then says the matter is yet unresolved. In other words, uh, you know, uh, uh, after throwing out all these debates and discussions, uh, Nobody ever resolved what the answer or the solution is. It still has to be resolved. You know, it's up to you to resolve it. But uh, here's the information being presented to you for future generations to, uh, uh, to, to decide how to handle this situation or these situations should they come up. Okay. Um, so uh, sometimes the Talmud will record something, uh, a classic example. Uh, the Talmud will record something that the t it's not really the Talmudic position, and then the anti-Semites will get a hold of it, and they'll quote this and say, well, the Talmud says, and if you go look up the passage, well, sure enough, the Talmud does say that. A uh, classic example is that there's a certain passage where the Talmud um, is quoted as saying that if you're going to commit a sin, you should go to a strange town and dress in a strange way, and go do it there, I, presumably where nobody would recognize you, and that's okay. But in fact, what the Talmud actually says, if you go look up the passage, is that a certain man was excommunicated and prohibited from being buried in the cemetery of the righteous because he gave heed to a teaching that said that. So it, it's uh, uh, there's a great deal of... Uh, uh, false information about what the Talmud actually does say. All right, so uh, um, 
we are in a, our study of the Talmud. We're not going to begin at uh, the very beginning and work our way through because there are literally thousands and thousands of pages of literally thousands of pages of Talmud. I mean, if you get a Talmud, uh, uh, an actual Talmud, it is published in volumes like a set of encyclopedias. Uh, um, and so it's not really viable for us to do that, especially in a beginner's class. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at some key uh, examples as beginners at uh, different Mishnah, Mishnot, that are recorded in the Talmud. And we're going to study them, and we're going to study the accompanying Gemara uh, to these uh, Mishnot. And so we're going to learn how to study Talmud together. And so um, we're going to begin in, uh, with a tractate, uh, a, a, mission, a, a pair of Mishnot, in a tractate called Nedarim. Nedarim deals with vows. That's what Nedarim means. It means vows. But it doesn't deal with vows like someone vows uh, something to the temple. You read about that in the Torah where somebody vows something to the temple. This is a different kind of vow that is talked about in the oral Torah um, that is uh, purely a creature of the oral Torah. It's, it's not, I mean, it is mentioned in the Torah, but it's only through the oral Torah that we know that that's what the Torah is talking about. The Karaites, they don't believe that's a kind of vow. They don't even uh, account for it. This kind of vow, though, is really the predecessor of the other kind of vow. And um, this kind of vow is where a person will make a vow, and that vow restricts something or someone from them. It's a kind of an oath. A vow is a kind of an oath. Uh, however, there is a different tractate that deals with oaths, and it's actually not even in the same order, and there's a reason for that. This, uh, the tractate Nedarim is in the order concerning women, and uh, that's because there's some special nuances and issues concerning women that are actually um, uh, relevant. So Numbers, uh, chapter 30, starting in verse 2 in, in the King James Version, but in a Jewish version it'll be verse 3. If a man vow a vow unto Yahweh, or unto the Lord, or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceeds out of his mouth. And the chapter goes on to discuss different things, like if a woman makes a vow and so on. We're just, that's the key verse that we're looking for. The oral, according to the oral Torah, this particular kind of vow that is being talked about here is not vowing something to the temple or to the priesthood. Uh, it's not making it hectish. It is a vow that simply restricts someone or something from me. Now, to make this kind of a vow, uh, I have to either own the object. If I own the object in question, say, this water, if I was making a vow and I'm not, I could say, this water is prohibited to me. <coughs> and the water would then be, uh, since I own it, it would be, I could say, this water is prohibited. Okay. If I did, then since I own the water, it would be prohibited, not just to me, but to everyone. It would be prohibited. You can't drink it. Okay, It's not permitted to drink this water. It's prohibited. However, if I don't own the water, if somebody else owns this bottle of water, I can still make the vow, but then the vow only applies to me because I don't control the water. So I'm prohibited to drink the water, but Shmuel can drink the water. Vane can drink the water, anyone else can, Yosef can drink the water, anyone else can drink the water, but I am prohibited from drinking the water. I can also make these kinds of vows concerning people, and uh, common phraseology will be something like, uh, um, uh, I'm prohibited from benefiting from you, or you're pro I prohibit you from, any. you shall not benefit anything from, from me. Now, in chapter one of Nedarim, and this is just kind of giving you some background material before we get to the Mishnah that we're actually going to study. Uh, in chapter one of Nedarim, we learn the formats for some of these and the key phrases, and one of the terms that's commonly used is korban. Now, korban means an offering, okay, literally. <coughs> but it's used in these vows, it doesn't actually mean 
that the thing that is being spoken of becomes an offering. It means it is prohibited to me just like an offering is prohibited from me, to me. So if I was making such a vow, a uh, uh, uh korban, this water is korban to me, which means it's like an offering to me. To me, it's like an offering. Uh, or it's korban, meaning it's prohibited to everyone. Okay? Uh, and and uh, there are a number of other euphemisms that are uh, uh, different words and phrases, some of them are either slurrings or different languages for Korban that the uh, Talmud talks about that will come into play later that are also permitted to use in this. Also I could say Korban, uh, uh, if, if anything of mine might benefit you, meaning um, that I'm prohibiting you from benefiting anything of mine. Okay. Um, so the, these are what, uh, uh, this is basically what the structure of these vows are. And in Nedarim chapter 3 in the Mishnah, uh, we find out that there are four basic reasons where these vows might be revoked. Normally they're not revoked because, as we read in Numbers chapter 30 in the Torah, uh, we should keep our vows. But there are special situations whereby they could be revoked, and you couldn't just revoke it yourself. Uh, it was kind of like being released from a contract. You could uh, have the vow revoked, but you had to go to the hochamim, the sages, to the court, the Beit Din, and say, uh, I would like to have my vow revoked. I want to be released from my vow. Uh, by what reason? And there were four reasons that a vow could be revoked. Um, or that a vow wouldn't be enforced. One was a vow of incitement. A vow of incitement would be um, if a merchant was uh, uh, trying to sell this bottle of water, for example, and the merchant were to uh, say in his negotiating, if he would uh, 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 say, Korban, if I sell this water f to you for less than a dollar. And then, negotiating back and forth, he sells the bottle for 95 cents. Well, uh, did he break his vow? Is he loosed from this vow? Uh, is, it in, you know, uh, is it an enforceable vow? And the answer is no. Not because he really should have done that, but because no one takes it seriously. It's a vow of incitement, and uh, it's, it's considered more of a figure of speech, and so the vow was not uh, enforced, considered enforceable. The next kind of vow that could be uh, revoked is uh, a vow of exaggeration. If, for example, somebody's telling a fish story and, you know, they're telling the story and they say, Corban, if the fish wasn't three feet, you know, and, um, or Corban, if the fish wasn't three miles long. Well, we know the fish wasn't three miles long. So, it's not, uh, uh, it's a figure of speech and it's not considered enforceable. It's not, which doesn't mean that people should take vows so lightly to use them as figures of speech, but since they do, um, obviously we're not going to try and enforce that in the court. It's revocable. It's not, it's not to be taken seriously. The next kind of vow that can be revoked is a little more serious. It's a vow that was made in error. Okay. Uh, for example, the classic example that's given in the Mishnah is the man who believes that uh, his wife has stolen his purse, stolen his money, and so um, he's very upset, he's very angry, he wants nothing to do with her. Um, he says, um, Korban, if I have relations with you, and he, in other words, he vows not to have relations with her. And we have a similar, by the way, uh, term it's not, we don't, uh, uh, for, for these vows, but we don't consider it, uh, you know, a real vow, but we say I'm swearing off of something, like I'm swearing off of you, or I'm swearing off of having, you know, sweets. Um, it doesn't mean, you know, it's not really a vow, but it, it descends from the same kind of, you know, of, of uh, uh, we use it just as a figure of speech, but it was actually considered very serious. So the man says, uh, Korban, if I have relations with you, to the wife, and so he takes a vow not to have relations with her. And something happens, maybe he finds the money somewhere, or he finds a receipt and realizes, oh, I forgot, I spent the money, and uh, I forgot that I spent the money off. 
uh, on the water. <laughs> so uh, I don't have, uh, the, that's what happened to the money. And so uh, uh, the, the real thief is discovered. And so uh, uh, he, he, said, he goes to the court and says, I made this vow. I wish to have it revoked because it was made in error. Generally speaking, it's a vow that was made in ignorance. And the key port part here is that you have to be able to go to the court to say, I would not have made the vow if I knew then what I know now. If I knew then, if I'd known she wasn't the thief, I would never have made that vow. It was made in error. It was a mistake. But now that I know better, I want to be released from the vow. And so that kind of vow is also uh, revocable. And this will become important later. And then a vow that is made under duress or that is broken under duress can be uh, revoked. Uh, obviously, if somebody is, you know, uh, holding a gun to your head, uh, then that vow is just like signing a contract under duress. It's not forcible, it's not valid, and so uh, that kind of vow is also um, revocable. Okay. So, that being said, we come now to our Mishnah. And our Mishnah is in Nedarim 9, uh, the first and second Mishnah, 1 and 2. Nedarim 9, 1 and 2 in the Mishnah. And it begins in the Talmud on page 64a. And um, the issue of our Mishnah is that sometimes, well, let, let me, let's just begin by, by uh, reading our, our Mishnah. Our Mishnah says, Rabbi Eliezer says, they open a vow for a man by reference to the honor of his father or his mother. Now what does this mean? Sometimes in um, Torah observance, it becomes necessary to violate one Torah commandment in order to keep another. Uh, the classic example of this, and we'll discuss this in another class at some point, is the commandment of circumcision. We're told to uh, circumcise every child on the eighth day after birth, but for one child out of seven, that's going to be on a, on a Sabbath. Every seventh day is a Sabbath. And on a Sabbath, we're prohibited from using tools like an instrument that we might use to circumcise and we're, we're prohibited from doing work. And so do we perform a circumcision on the Sabbath? Yeshua discusses this issue. The Talmud discusses this issue. And the answer that both come to is yes, that we do. And again, that'll be another, uh, another study. But that's an example. Here the example is that Numbers chapter 30, verse 3, uh, verse 2 in the, in the Christian version, says that we should keep our vows. We are directed to keep our vows. Okay. Um, on the other hand, the uh, the Ten Commandments in the Torah famously tell us that we should uh, uh, honor our mother and our father in Exodus chapter twenty, verse twelve, and it's repeated again in Deuteronomy five sixteen. Honor your mother and your father. So we have a mitzvah that says to honor your mother and your father. We have another mitzvah that says to uh, keep your vow, if you make a vow, to keep it. And so Eliezer says, well, what happens in the situation, which, uh, you know, I'm in the dilemma, which, which mitzvah do I break? Um, Obviously, you know, I don't have to break one. One of them is actually loosed for the other. Yeshua talks about this concept in Matthew 23. I believe it's verse 23. He refers to the weightier commandments of the Torah, telling us that some commandments of Torah are weightier than other commandments of Torah. Okay, so Rabbi Eliezer says they open a vow for a man by reference to the honor of his father or his mother. So a man comes to the court and he says, I made a vow. And uh, now I realize this vow dishonors my parents. Um, maybe I'm in, it, it embarrasses my parents that I made a vow. Making vows is disreputable. That's not uh, you know, a really refutable thing to do. And uh, uh, there's a saying in the in Tractate Yoma that says, 
uh, if the if the uh, sons uh, are Russia, the fathers are Russia. Russia means a wicked man. If the son's a wicked man, the father's a wicked man. Uh, we have a similar uh, saying. We say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, or like father, like son. And so um, it reflects poorly on the parents that I made this vow. And so um, I wish to be released from my vow because it dishonors my parents. So, uh, um, you know, I've got a dilemma. I've got to either honor my parents or keep the vow. Um, and so I wish to have the vow revoked. So Rabbi Eliezer says in such a situation, we, re we, we have an opening to revoke the vow. And the sages prohibit the Chmim. The Chmim are the sages. That When the Mishnah refers to the sages, that's the majority. It means the majority. The sages prohibit. So we have a conflict between Rabbi Eliezer on the one hand and the majority, the Chmim, the sages. Rabbi Eliezer says, yes, we revoke this vow. The sages say, no, we don't, we don't revoke that kind of a vow. Okay, the Mishnah, our Mishnah continues. Said Rabbi Zadok, before they open a vow for him by reference to his father or mother, let them open his vow by reference to the honor of Hamakom. That's a euphemism for Elohim. Let them, if they're going to, so Rabbi Zadok says, hey, well, if we're going to, um, depending on how you read this, and the next phrase becomes key. And, uh, in fact, let's go into the next phrase. Um, because the next phrase really, uh, on the next phrase, hinges how we interpret what Rabbi Zedok said. The next phrase is uh, uh, a phrase of much debate amongst Talmud scholars uh, and Mishnah scholars and the ancient commentaries. The next phrase says, if so, there will be no vow. But it doesn't tell us who says, if so, there will be no vow. In fact, there's great debate as to who says this. Um, our first thought is that Rabbi Zadok has said it. And if Rabbi Zadok has said it, uh, it means that Rabbi Zadok is using a kol vechomer argument against Rabbi Eliezer on behalf of the sages. In other words, one of the stages you know, after they say, no, we don't, we don't do that, one of them steps forward and says, this is why we don't do it. Uh, and he presents a kol vechomer argument. And uh, a kol vechomer argument, kol vechomer means light and heavy. It's the first rule of Hillel, of Hillel's rules of interpretation of the scriptures. Uh, Hillel compiled seven rules of interpretation of the scriptures. And like I said, it's number one. And... Um, what he is saying is he says if we're going to release a person for a, a vow because they're em, they've embarrassed their parents dishonored their parents because they made a vow and that in itself is dis, disreputable and that reflects poorly on their parents then why not uh, release a man from a vow. If we do that, then we release a man from a vow because it dishonored Elohim. I mean, that's of even greater weight. And so then he follows that argument to its fullest conclusion. And then, you know, there's an old saying that an argument that proves too not much proves nothing at all. So by following it full to its fullest conclusion, then he turns around and he says, then there would be no vows. In other words, uh, vows were just, uh, um, nobody would be, made, vows would become meaningless. I mean, if any vow could be revoked simply because it dishonored Elohim, and all vows could be said to dishonor Elohim, then uh, vows would suddenly have no meaningful power. So Rabbi Zedok says, we can't do that, because if we did that, uh, it would be destructive, it would just, it would make all vows meaningless. However, uh, there is another interpretation of this phrase. If so, there will be no vow. The other interpretation is that the sages use this phrase, and the sages are responding to Rabbi Zanuck. 
and that instead Rabbi Zedok is actually agreeing with Rabbi Eliezer. So Rabbi Zedok is saying, you know what, Rabbi Eliezer? Not only do we lease a man from a vow by reference to the honor of his mother and father because making a vow embarrassed his parents, dishonored them. Not only that, I agree with you, but on top of that, I think we ought to release a man from a vow if he cites reference to uh, the honor of Elohim. After all, Elohim is of even greater weight. You're right. I, I, you're right. I call your uh, dishonoring of parents, and I raise you a dishonoring of Elohim. And the sages say to both of them, <laughs> if, you, if we did that, there'd be no vows. Now, the effect is the same. Uh, either Rabbi Zedok presents his argument as a kol vechamer argument to, tr to lead to the conclusion that that's unsustainable, or uh, he makes it unsustainable and the sages then come in and say, ah, but that's unsustainable. Okay. Our Mishnah continues, because it doesn't end here. It doesn't end here. Either the, you might think a collusion has been reached. But the sages concede to Rabbi Eliezer that in a matter that is between him and his father, his mother and father, they lose his vow by reference to his father or mother. So, now we have a, uh, a, a vow that is loosed, uh, it can be loosed, uh, if, a, if a man comes to the court and says, um, the, the, if he has a vow that involves only him and his mother and his father, for example, if he had said Korban to his father, if he had turned around to his father and he said Korban uh, of mine, anything that might benefit you, then uh, that kind of a vow involves only him and his father, dishonors his father, that can be released. And in fact, we see exactly that kind of vow mentioned in the Mishnah, or in uh, chapter 5, uh, in Mishnah 6, of, uh, chapter 5. There's a story presented, and actually it's talking about a totally different issue. Um, but a story is presented, and it says there was someone at Beit Horon whose father was prohibited by vow from deriving benefit from him. And in fact, uh, that vow creates a special problem that's not really related to what we're talking about. It creates a different problem uh, altogether. And uh, uh, so such vows did, did occur, did exist, and that, there's an example there of that kind of a vow. And so our sages say, in that situation, we, we release you from the vow. The, the, we release the vow. The, we, re we agree with you, Rabbi Eliezer, in that situation. Our mission continues because Rabbi Eliezer and the and the sages and the, on these on this this kind of an issue they are locking horns. They don't agree. Rabbi Eliezer says they unloose a vow by reference to what happens unexpectedly. This is Mishnah Netarim nine two. And further, <clears throat> get Rabbi Eliezer saying, they unloose a vow by reference to what happens unexpectedly, or a new fact. Something unexpected happens, we release the vow. The sages prohibit. So again, the sages disagree with him. How so? In other words, what kind, what are we talking about here? If, he said, this is Rabbi Eliezer, <clears throat> Konam, Konam is one of these euphemisms I told you about that's used instead of Korban. Konam, be what I enjoy, which derives from so-and-so, and the person was appointed a scribe. Or the person was marrying off his son in the near future. And he who took the vow then said, if I had known that he would be appointed a scribe or that he would be marrying off his son in the near future, I would never have made such an oath. So the situation comes up where a uh, man comes to the court and he says, I, uh, um, I made a vow to, uh, to 
derive no benefit from this individual, uh, the individual, the person in question, somewhere down the line, he became the town scribe. And I needed a ketuva, a marriage certificate, or, heaven forbid, a get, a, a divorce decree. And, and uh, or, let's put a, a brighter spin on it, I needed new phylacteries, you know, the scrolls and the phylacteries, or I needed a new, a new masusa for the door. And um, he was the town scribe. I had no one, I, I couldn't come to him and derive benefit from him because of the vow that I'd taken. If I'd known he was gonna become the town scribe, I would not have made the vow. And uh, it, was an, it's, it was unexpected. And uh, Rabbi Eliezer says, in this situation, we release him from the vow, but the sages say, no, no we don't. Or, if uh, he comes to the court and he says, I uh, made the vow to derive no benefit from, uh, you know, Joe over there, and um, now it turns out Joe is going to have a son that's going to be of marrying age. I've got a, a daughter that I need to see into, you know, get married. I need to make sure she has a secure future. She's taken care of. And uh, um, so... You know, I need to be able to marry my daughter off to his son, but I've sworn to take no benefit from him, so I wish to be released from my vow because I didn't know that he this was going to happen. If I'd known this was going to happen, it was unexpected. If I'd known this was going to happen, I wouldn't have made the vow. I should never have made the oath. Rabbi Eliezer says, we release the vow. The sages say, no, no, we do not release that kind of a vow. Uh, if he said, Konam, be this house, if I enter it. So he takes a vow concerning a building. Maybe it's a residence, maybe it's a business. Uh, he becomes upset with the proprietor, or with the owner of the home, and he dusts his feet from the, from the, you know, the dust, the, uh, shakes the dust from his feet, and he, he says, Konam, if I ever enter this building again. And it was turned into a synagogue. And he says, if I'd known, he comes to the court and he says, if I'd known that it would be made into a synagogue, I would not have made such an oath. Rabbi Eliezer permits. Rabbi Eliezer says, yes, we release him from the vow. And the sages prohibit. That's the end of Mishnah Nedarim 9.2. And the disputes that Eliezer is having with the majority. And uh, the Gemara begins. And so the Gemara treats each of these two Mishnah separately, but sort of together, because they are somewhat related. So the Gemara now, uh, which we're uh, still on at the bottom of page 64a, the Gemara will con uh, begin to discuss our first Mishnah, the Mishnah Nedarim 9.1 in which Rabbi Eliezer uh, said that if uh, a man comes uh, to the sages to have his vow released uh, because it dishonors his mother and his father, the sages say, uh, he says, we, we revoke it. The sages say no, but the sages say, yeah, we do revoke it if it um, uh, involves only him and his father. Okay, or him and his mother. And so our Gemara says, what is meant by there are no vows or there shall be no vows? Um, what, is, what does this mean? Uh, as I said, this is a controversial uh, phrase in the Mishnah. Much hinges on what it means. And the Gemara gives even another twist, actually a couple of pair of twists, if you will, uh, in a debate that takes place between Rabbi Abaya and uh, Rabbi. Uh, these were study partners and they would debate with each other as they studied the, Torah, the, the, the Mishnah together, the Torah together, the world Torah together. And, um, and so Abaya says, if so, vows are not properly revoked. We're at the very end of page 64a. So, if so, vows are not properly revoked. 
Rabbi explained. Oh, let, hold on. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll explain more about what this means as we continue. But let us turn, oh, no, turn actually. Let us go to the next column, 64B. At the top of the next column, Rabbah explained, if so, no one will seek a sage's absolution for his vow. Okay, well, let me first explain what Abaya means and we'll continue. Abaya, Abaya, sorry, what Abaya is saying, Abaya is saying, is that um, our context must be considered here and our dispute that Rabbi Eliezer is having with the sages deals with when a vow should be revoked. And so, when the passage in the Mishnah says um, there would be no vows, it is in reference to the revoking of vows, and that is to be understood. And so what it means is that no vow would be properly revoked, or literally revoked with beauty, with yafe, he says. Okay. So, Abaya says no vows would be properly revoked. Rabbah explains it, if so, no one would seek a sage's absolution for his vow. In other words, no, what he's, what he's saying is that no one would uh, try, would go to the sages to have a vow revoked. That's what's being talked about here. And uh, because if um, a vow could be revoked simply by reference to the honor of Elohim, which is what the point was at that point, in time in our Mishnah, uh, if a vow could be revoked simply by reference to the honor of Elohim, then it's a no-brainer. You know? I mean, uh, all vows could be revoked. It's a given. It's a, a no-question situation. And if it's a no-question situation, why do I need to go to the court to have it done? Because, you know, the court, the purpose for taking it to the court is that, uh, you know, I need to consult the authorities to determine if it can be revoked or not. But if there's no question, if any vow could be revoked simply by reference to the uh, uh, to the honor of Elohim, then no one would go to the court to have vows revoked. Okay, and that can't be because we know that uh, from the rest of our oral Torah, at least, that people do go to the court to have their vows revoked. Okay, our Gemara continues. We learned, but the sages admit to Rabbi Eliezer that in a manner concerning himself and his father and mother, their honor is suggested as an opening. Okay. Our Gemara now goes to the conclusion of the Mishnah, to the conclusion that the sages reached, because they're, uh, and says, okay, well, let's look at the conclusion that the sages reached and see if that's compatible with, and if that even naturally, even better, if that naturally flows from the understanding that Rabbi Abaya has or the understanding that Rabbah has concerning this uh, phrase of Mishnah. So it says, and now, as for Abaya, who explains it as meaning, if so, vows are not properly revoked. It is well here, since he has been impudent he is impudent now what does that mean you're not this is what i said without some guidance and instruction you just pick up the talmud you're going to find it very difficult to study what does that mean well you have to understand um the uh, the whole of the subject matter uh and and it helps sometimes to have the commentaries you know uh and and so on but uh, what abaya is saying here is that if a person, let's let's take the first situation, the situation, because uh, we basically have three situations that we're talking about here in the Mishnah. One, the situation where the man says, well, I wanted my vow revoked because it embarrasses my parents. Second is the situation where the man says, I want my vow revoked because it embarrasses Elohim. And the third situation uh, where uh, I want my vow revoked and it is revoked because it is uh, dishonoring to my parents and it involves me and my parents alone. So let's take the, uh, the the situation where the man says, "I want my vow revoked because it dishonors Elohim." Okay, uh, why 
is that not a permissible situation, Abiah says? And why does this phrase, there shall be no vows, tell us that that's not permissible, uh, we can't do that? And Abiah says, because uh, when we, pre what Abiah is saying is when we bring the person to the court, when the person comes to the court to testify, uh, they have to be uh, able, it has to be reasonable that they're going to testify truthfully to the court. And so if you're going to bring the person into the court, and remember the key thing we said here was that you had to be able to say, if I had known then what I know now, I would not have made the vow. Okay. So if we bring the person into the court, to the sages, and we say, would you, if you had known now what you knew then, if you know known then what you knew now, I'm sorry, uh, would you have made the vow? In other words, uh, would you have dishonored Elohim? Well, who's going to say, yeah, yeah, I, I don't care about Elohim, really. I, I, I would dishonor Elohim. Nobody is going to say that. And it's not even conceivable that somebody would say that. Uh, it's, it's kind of similar, but not exactly like a defense attorney in our modern times in, in the United States. He's not allowed to ask uh, a question of a witness if he knows that the test, the witness's answer will be a lie. He's not allowed to participate in that way. And so, um, uh, the uh, uh, likewise, uh, we don't uh, uh, allow that kind of. The, 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 it, it would be ridiculous to try and pursue that in court. So there's no realistic expectation that you're getting a truthful testimony. And so, in that situation, it would be impossible to revoke the vow because you can't uh, get reliable testimony. If you can't get reliable testimony, then the court can't make uh, a real determination as to the truth of the facts. However, uh, Rabbi, uh, uh, Rabbi Abbas' point is that if the person had instead made a vow to one of their parents, concerning one of their parents, uh, anything of mine that might, Korban, and anything of mine that might have benefited you, and so thus dishonored their parents, and then repented and came to the court uh, and said, I've repented if I had, you know, understood the gravity then and known then what I, I know now. Well, it's already on the table that they dishonored their parents. The vow itself was a dishonoring of parents. Uh, it, it, there's no question as to whether... So we know the person doesn't have to hide and conceal and say, well, I don't want them to know that I dishonored my parents. That's on the table. So we can accept their testimony because we know that they could just as easily come into court or not come to court at all or come into court and say, well, you know what? I, I really don't care about uh, uh, honoring my parents. I, I, don't li I don't like my parents. I dishonor them. Um, you know, so I, I would make the, the, you know, the vow. So it is reasonable you can bring that person into court and ask them and get a realistic answer. So Rabbi Abaya says in that situation, yes, we can loose the person from the vow. But we can't if it's, if, uh, it's a vow concerning El, uh, the honor of Elohim. And so that is Rabbi's, um, uh, Rabbi, uh, Abaya's answer. Our, mish, our, our Gemara continues. But on Rabbi's explanation, if so none will seek a sage's absolution for his vow. That's what Rabah's explanation was. So Rabah says that the problem is no one will go to the sages to have their vows revoked, as we said, because they're, it's a no-brainer. They're all revocable simply by uh, uh, calling upon the honor of Elohim. Uh, so is Rabah's explanation viable with the conclusion it does it lead to the conclusion of the sages? And so um, we read in our, our Gemara, why is such an opening suggested to him here? The Gemara is asking him, asking Rabbah, clarify your opinion. Why would such a, a, an opening being su be suggested then in the situation where a person uh, had made a vow that, uh, that dishonored their parents that only involved them and their parents? I will tell you, he says, it's really a simple answer. 
since all other vows cannot be annulled without a sage, it may be offered as an opening here also. Okay, so our, uh, uh, our, gem our Gemara uh, to the first Mishnah concludes here. Uh, what he is saying, by the way, is that if our uh, uh, people already know that they go to the sages to have vows released, uh, for example, if it was made in error, so now they would know that you also go to, a, to the sages to have, if we in, in introduced this one special instance where a vow could be released by reference to the honor of the mother and father, if it only involved you and the mother or father, then, in fact, um, people would know that they have to go to the sages to have that released too. It works. And so it also uh, uh, is compatible with and leads to the conclusion of the, the sages. So both uh, uh, Abaya's view and uh, uh, Rabah's view um, are compatible with the thought process that was taking place uh, with in, the, in our mission. Okay, uh, we're going to continue the Gemara, uh, which will go into the second Mishnah next week, uh, but for, uh, in our next study. But uh, we're going to uh, uh, stop there in the Gemara. But I do want to, to look now at Matthew chapter 15 in the uh, teachings of our Messiah Yeshua. And uh, this, uh, this particular uh, Mishnah and Gemara, this particular halakhic issue that we've just discussed, uh, is actually uh, comes up very specifically in Matthew chapter 15. Verse 1, Then came near to him scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem, saying, Why do your Talmudim transgress the decree of the elders? For they clean not their hands when they eat bread. Well, that's a different issue. But verse 3. But he answered them, and he said, And why do you transgress the commandments of Elohim by means of your decrees? Is it not written in your Torah from the mouth of Elohim, Honor your father and your mother? As we said, that's Exodus 20, 12, and Deuteronomy 5, 16. And moreover written... And he that curses his father and his mother will surely die. Exodus 21, 17 and Leviticus 20, verse 9. But you say, whoever says to father and mother, it is all an offering, whatever of mine might profit you or benefit you. That word offering, okay, in uh, the Aramaic text, both the Old Syriac and the Peshitta, is korban. In the uh, um, Greek text of Mark, the parallel passage has the word korban literally transliterated right into the Greek text of Mark. There is a, a, um, a collection of marginal notes to certain Greek manuscripts of Matthew uh, that also say that you know, they're called the, refer to a re, uh, something called the Judaicon or Jewish version that say that the Jewish version of Matthew, or the Judaicon, has korban here. So clearly it is korban, which is the very term that we talked about, uh, that's the standard term used. So this is exactly the kind of vow that we have been discussing. And he honors not his father and his mother, thus have you made void the commandments of Elohim on account of your judgments. Now you must understand that this took place before the discussion we read in the Mishnah, because Rabbi Eliezer lived in the late first century and early second century, and uh, Abayah and Rabbah lived, of course, uh, in the uh, era of the Gemara, and the, uh, they were honoring, they lived after that time. And um, so this is actually uh, a discussion that Yeshua was having with certain Pharisees before this discussion took place in the, uh, that was recorded in the mission of the court case. And it's important to realize that Rabbi Eliezer that we were reading about is a very interesting fellow because the Talmud tells us that he was accused of being a Nazarene 
and that he was eventually excommunicating, excommunicated from Pharisaic Judaism for refusing to accept the rulings of the majority of the Pharisees in the majority of Sanhedrin. Okay? And he was not, uh, he was disfellowshipped until after his death. And then he was refellowshipped uh, after his death. And, uh, but he was a very important sage. He's the sixth, in fact, his teacher said about him, about Rabbi Eliezer, that if he had all of his other students had a scale, and he had all of his other students in one pan of the scale, and Rabbi Eliezer in the other pan of the scale, that Rabbi Eliezer would outweigh all of them. Okay, so Rabbi Eliezer was probably, almost certainly, a student of Yeshua, if not directly. In fact, there's evidence that he was a student of perhaps James the Just, of Yaakov Hatzadi, Yeshua's brother, half-brother. Okay, so, um, but he, he, he was a student of Yeshua's teachings. And so he actually is bringing Yeshua's argument into the Mishnah. There is also no conflict between Yeshua's teaching in Matthew chapter 15 and the teaching in the Talmud. The situation that Yeshua presents in Matthew chapter 15 is one in which the sages agree with Rabbi Eliezer. It is one which involves the man and his mother and father. So the, the, uh, um, the Talmud says, yes, in this situation, the man's vow is fully revocable. He can, he can honor his parents. There's no, no problem here. Okay, he doesn't have to keep the vow. So um, Yeshua is debating with a, either a minority group or Yeshua's teaching actually, instead of this view that people had that the Pharisees were just, you know, closed their ears and wanted, you know, had, you know, no, walked walked away uh, without any uh, uh, interest in what Yeshua had to say. To the contrary, uh, the Pharisaic position was altered by Yeshua's teaching. Uh, yeah, that may be the case, or it may be the case that this was simply a minority group that held to held to an obscure halacha that was overturned in our Mishnah. Okay. Also, it's important to note that people will quote Matthew chapter 15 as an attack on Jewish tradition in general and the Talmud, which is rather peculiar because Matthew 15 actually agrees with the Talmud. Okay, um, and the reason, uh, but this is also a problem because Matthew chapter 15 does not attack tradition. Yeshua doesn't attack tradition in Matthew 15. He atta attacks traditions of men implying that maybe there are traditions of Elohim. But on top of that, he doesn't attack traditions of men. He attacks traditions of men that conflict with the word of Elohim. He says nothing about traditions of men that don't conflict with the word of Elohim. And in fact, an Orthodox Jew, any Orthodox Jew or Orthodox rabbi today, if you went to him and you said, look, if you had a, tr a human-made tradition of man that conflicted with the word of Elohim in the Tanakh, which one, would you, which one do you follow? Any Orthodox Jew would tell you the Tanakh, the word of Elohim. No tradition of men is permitted to uh, conflict with the word of Elohim in the Tanakh. And so, uh, Yeshua and Orthodox Jews are saying the same thing in Matthew chapter 15. Yeshua doesn't say anything in Matthew chapter 15 that an Orthodox Jew wouldn't agree with. So he can't be attacking the Talmud. Uh, and, he, and another interesting aspect of this is that Yeshua participates in the halachic debate in Matthew chapter 15. And that's another interesting thing because when Yeshua dialogues with Pharisees about whether uh, a man who has taken a vow uh, that concerns his fa mother or his father, uh, you know, um, korban, anything of mine that might have benefited you, um, whether that vow can be revoked or not, whether that's a valid vow or not, uh, or whether he should honor his mother and his father and not keep the vow. And it, it's a valid question because it's a question of whether uh, one should follow uh, Exodus 20:12 or uh, Numbers chapter 30, verse 2. Okay, it's a, it's a valid question. And so uh, uh, when Yeshua engages in this debate uh, and gives a conclusion that this is... Uh, wonderful and, 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 and great and, and everybody's 
happy. But when the Talmud engages in exactly the same debate and comes to essentially the same conclusion, the Talmud is somehow evil and wicked and tradition of men. It is, of course, uh, an unsustainable argument. Okay, so uh, uh, that's uh, the end of our study today. Uh, we now understand the argument. We understand what is being debated and what is being discussed in Matthew chapter 15 better. And so Matthew, the, the Talmud helps us better understand what Yeshua is teaching in Matthew chapter 15. And Yeshua helped the sages, whether they realized it or not, better understand the debate they were having in the Mishnah in uh, Netarim chapter 9. Okay. So, um, uh, next time we're going to continue our Gemara in, on page 64b of Netarim and uh, what, this, what the uh, Gemara says about the debate that Eliezer had with the sages about whether a vow could be revoked in an unexpected, if some unexpected circumstance arises. Okay, so thank you for studying with us today. Shalom, shalom, and we hope that you will uh, join us for future studies as we continue our studies of Talmud for beginners. Shalom.